Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Marantz PM5005 amplifier. So first off let's just take a look at general specifications. So RMS power output, um, this is for both channels, we're looking at 45 watts into 8 ohm speaker load or 50 watts times 2 into 4 ohms. And then total harmonic distortion covering frequency range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz is 0.05 percent and then frequency response cd uh, one one eight arm load that's 10 hertz to 50 kilohertz and then in terms of input selection all is electronic also you can have a remote control which is normally supplied as standard with it but if you buy these and you know, maybe from auction websites you could get them with or without the remotes but they're still available so if you do want to sort of source one you can go to the authorized um, suppliers for uh, spares and they'll, they'll provide one for you. Uh, CD input, uh, tuner, network, record one, record two and it also supports the phono input as well. So that's a moving magnet type cartridge and that would be 2.2 millivolts with a standard impedance of 47 uh, k ohms and then overall weight you're looking at 6.7 kilograms and then dimensions height is 105 by a width of 440 and a depth of 370 millimeters and the amplifier you know is highly sought after there's there's differences the 5000 series 4000 series and then also the 6000 and cosmetically when you look at the amplifier you know it does look good you know so uh, you know, sort of from that uh, from facial appeal you know straight away you know it looks good uh, and I like also as well you have like metal knobs which are used then for the input selection and also for your volume control and you get positive feedback on that the same with some of the other user controls as well it also supports a headphone socket uh, for um, you know, direct sort of um, personal listening and then two sets of speakers so you can connect speaker set uh, one and speaker set two and you can select them from the front fascia and then you also have the ability to have a loudness so again front panel push button or via remote and source direct which is normal for all amplifiers nowadays where you can bypass the tone circuits if you need to so what was the issue with this amplifier well when it came in uh, really didn't have a fault description as such so initial testing just sort of confirmed that there was an issue with no audio at all on the right channel now this sort of fault on this series of amplifier is not unusual as more and more of them are in the field and they've done you know a number of years of operation um, I do tend to see I'm saying an over regular basis but I do see them on a fairly regular basis coming to the workshop for service and repair so the first thing to sort of look at and again I'll give a little bit more insight because I've repaired you know many of these amplifiers with this type of fault you know I don't want to just sort of just jump in and say okay well this is what the fault is uh, and this is what you do just to replace it because you yourselves who are listening right now you may be faced with exactly the same issue where you only have audio on one one channel and uh, you may you know undertake then to sort of repair the amp so I'll just give you a little bit of insight how you would undertake sort of the the repair and then testing them so uh, once the front cover had been or the, or the top cover had been removed the first thing of course which is normal um, and this is just you know before we identify the issue with the right channel is just take a visual inspection very very important you know you can usually pick up particular issues when you do that so first off having a look inside of there you know I'm just checking the general condition of the board and also when I remove that top cover it was clear after the screws had been removed it had never been taken off you know since factory so that that's good from a repairer's point of view because you know no one's been in there and maybe carrying out some form of repair work what you're dealing with is a fault which has occurred and you're the first person then to investigate it and then the next thing to do here was to apply a test audio signal coming in you know I could use a signal generator but because I have an audio signal tracer what I'm able to do is just connect to the CD input and then the first thing that I want to do and I'll show this in the video you have um, a connector which is on the main board and it's right next to the input selection IC and what happens with that multi-pin connector is it carries the ground and then the left and right channel audio from the input selector chip and it passes that through via the interconnector onto 
the volume control board let me show this you'll also see on this backdrop as well for this for this photo you can see that there's probe leads which are connected into where we would normally set the bias and we'll come back to that in a moment uh, the only reason why i mention this at this point in time is if you look at the multimeter you can see that it's you know it's over 31 millivolts so straight away and i've seen this so many times with, with these morantz amplifiers the nominal bias should be 20 millivolts per channel and uh, they always seem to be high and, and you know, i don't think it's just a single case where it's drifted over time because that's quite a considerable drift but we'll come back to that a little bit later you would know because even when the amplifier was idling you know the heat sink is not red hot but it's definitely relatively warm so those output transistors are being over biased then and then on the multi-pin connector it also will carry with it the plus and minus 15 volts supply onto the volume control board so what i do is i use the audio signal tracer and i just go onto the connector there and then i'm just verifying the left and right channel that was confirmed so i knew that i had no issue with the input selection ic sometimes those ic's can be damaged if maybe the user changes different inputs and doesn't fully disconnect maybe the left or then the right channel input and then moves it across because you get an impedance issue and then it can take out the chip so that wasn't the issue here and then the next thing that i do is just to verify that there's no break in that cable i just verify that the audio signals are arriving onto the volume control board which they are and then the next part then to test is to verify if the signal is being processed through that board and um, what you have is a multi-pin connector i'll sort of show this again on the video it, when the volume control board is fitted if you remove the front knob you have two fixing screws once those are removed you can literally pull the board out and you have a multi-pin connector so again you have voltages on there which are passing through onto the front board which is also where the tone board is but you'll also see left and right channel out so just be a little bit careful if you're making the test for me you get the probably from the audio signal tracer just put the ground onto the ground speaker terminal and i could pick up on the left but nothing on the right so i was very confident then that the issue had nothing to do with the tone board or, or that front panel board the fault was lying on the volume selector board or the volume uh, control board so once i'd removed that what i'm able to do then is to make a number of test measurements now it, the fault could be due maybe you've lost the signal because there's an open circuit capacitor or maybe there's a resistor gone high etc but a very very common issue here is the volume control potentiometer fails and it tends always to be on the right channel so the way in which you can do this of course you can turn the volume control board over and then you can use your multimeter and try and multimeter around the multi pins which come from the volume control board or as i show in the video you have two resistors on the board which are actually electrically connected to the volume control potentiometer so the first one is r500 and it's a 56k resistor and that's for the right channel and then there's r5003 it's equivalent then for the left now if you take your multimeter and this is with the board disconnected from the from the front control front tone board no power applied so i'm just doing static resistance measurements if i put my multimeter across say r5003 with the volume control turned down to minimum i read about 6.5k and as i increase it then of course then the resistance will change and i'm able to read that resistance change directly across r5003 so as i'm doing the adjustment i can get it to swing from about 6k ohms to probably about 43 44k ohms and the volume control potentiometer is a 50k a which is an audio taper and it also has as well a direct taper as well but i'll put a link in the video um, description because i did do an audio blog which covered different types of potentiometers and that give you more insight about different types of tapers then now when i connected across r500 did exactly the same thing but straight away it was pretty much reading about 56k ohms and no matter how i adjusted the volume control potentiometer then no difference in measurement so that told me that that volume control potentiometer the right gang of it 
uh, was open circuit. So straightforward repair, just desoldering it. You'll also note that it's a motorized type. And the part number, if you need to source one, is 00D94319789. And I'll put the part number again in the description for the video. Now, if you do a Google search for that part number, you'll actually see that it comes up as a Denon 500AE volume control potentiometer. So, as you gather, the same volume control potentiometer is used on these Marantz series amplifiers, including the 6000, and it's also used then on the Denon amplifiers as well. So, you know, that could be like the 720AE or 520AE. So, pretty much universal. Uh, if it's just a one off repair for yourself, great, you fist it. But uh, if you're in the service and repair game, you might want to make a note if you have a couple of these in stock that they are universal and you can use them between you know, each amplifier. So once the volume control potentiometer was replaced, I'm then just installing the board back in and then I can just do a quick test. I don't tend to connect the speakers at this point. I've just got my headphones plugged in and make sure that I've got source direct. And uh, sure enough, both the right channel and the left channel audio was present then. And then if I rotated the balance control, then I've got full right channel and then I've got full left channel. So all good. And I'll show a extract from the service manual in the video and you can see the volume control potentiometer and then they've color coded from the manual just the different track. So i.e. which one is the left and then which one is the right. Now the next part really is this bias adjustment and I mentioned it earlier so it was way over so again I've put an extract from the service manual and what you are seeing are the test points and they're also shown on the photograph for the output channel so it's straightforward enough you just connect your multimeter onto the test points which would be test points one and three the center one is just common then to uh, pin one of that connector and you would have no speakers connected, volume and control at minimum, and then the balance, bass and treble controls then at midpoint. And you wait probably for about 15-20 minutes, just in an environment where it's draft free and the temperature is, is stable. And you just wait for the amplifier just to warm through. After that point, you can then make the adjustment. So straightforward, you can see that the preset is on, to, on the board and it's clearly marked. It's a 2.2k trimmer. And the service manual uh, will also give you the information of which trimmer is for which channel. And all you do is you just adjust it until you read 20 millivolts across those that test connector. So the one that I'm showing here in the video is the left channel. Uh, but of course you've got you know, the equivalent then for the right channel. So just make the adjustment. If the heat sink was running fairly warm, what I'd say is once you've made that adjustment, you know, just don't consider it just a one off. You know, leave it running them for about five minutes and then let everything then just sort of stabilize in terms of temperature and then you can then make the final adjustment now for this amplifier you know it didn't come from a from a, a probably harsh environment at all you know the environment was very very good and uh, so really there wasn't a lot of cleaning you know to be had just a case of just brushing off the amplifier internally just with a stiff brush um but you know really good really and then last part is just the testing of the remote control because this amplifier had very very little usage uh, normally just replace the batteries always something to check with these handheld devices you know probably one of the issues that you can find is people tend to leave batteries in remote controls for far too long and if you look on any of these batteries they're triple a type you'll normally have an expiry date or date code the last thing you want is that it goes beyond that then the battery starts to break down and then you get leakage and it's highly corrosive and it could damage the connectors within the remote or maybe get through and then damage the board once i've replaced the batteries of course i can test it with the amplifier which it's done you know check the volume control and input selection etc but i also have a remote control test unit so I just enable a battery power device and then I can just work my way through each one of the keys or buttons on the remote to make sure that they're working. This had no usage, so there was no concern, but you've seen on previous repair videos that I've provided an overview for, you may get some ingress of liquid 
or if the remote control has been used extensively it will wear away the conductive um, coating on the rubber pads on the keypad and you'll need to make a repair but if you refer back to some of the other repair videos you can see you can buy these self-adhesive pads which are conductive and it's quite straightforward then to make the repair so you know not a complex repair here you know but we've sort of come to the end of this one um, so what I'd say is if you have any questions or you need any help or insight by all means email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and I'll be more than happy to help you with you know any, any questions and give you any advice or any support so as always thank you very much for stopping by and I appreciate you listening until the next time cheers bye bye